Good afternoon. My name is Teresa Imperato, the ALSA Clinical Specialist here at the Greater New York Chapter. The, uh, this year's uh, Educational and Resource Summit is winding down, and I hope you've been enjoying all of the uh, sessions that you've been going to. I hope you've been learning a lot. Before we start this session, I just want to remind you that there is a Q&A icon at the lower section of your screen. Click there and type any questions throughout the presentation, and we will do our best to get through all the questions at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Lorraine Donowski, Dr. Lorraine Donowski. She is a registered dietitian with the Christopher Pendergast ALS Center at Stony Brook, and she has worked with patients, ALS patients and their families for 20 years. She was at the initial meetings at Stony Brook to set up the ALS clinic prior to its start, and she's proud to say that she's a, an original member of the clinic. She has presented at the National ALS Association's clinical conferences and contributed, contributed to their website on how and when a feeding tube is right for you. She's been involved in web webinars and calls on behalf of the national office. She's also presented posters at the Niels ALS Consortium and the clinical, tri uh, clinical conference at, ALS, uh, at the ALS Clinical Conference. As director of the dietetic internship program at Stony Brook, she has not only been providing nutritional care to patients, but she's also educated years and years of upcoming dietitians about nutritional issues that ALS patients face. She believes so strongly in the interdisciplinary clinic that, she, that it proved to be a good model for patient care and for future care for patients that she was able to look at it as and during her doctor, doctoral work. Oh my gosh, sorry. She continues to work with ALS patients and their families to provide the utmost up-to-date nutritional options and care possible. We welcome Lorraine. Thank you so much for being here today to answer our questions for nutrition with ALS patients. Okay, well thank you actually for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to see everyone in the virtual world. Um, I just wanted to say that, uh, Teresa, thank you for that lovely introduction. I was able to use the interdisciplinary team model to study um, ALS treatment teams across the country. And I looked at uh, a couple of different, you know, it was a survey design and I looked at a couple of different uh, factors. I was looking at how well coordinated each team was uh, um, among themselves and getting things patients quickly. I also uh, looked at uh, compassion fatigue, which is a, a measure to see um, how well everyone adjusts to working, you know, with this patient population. And so those were things, factors that I looked at as, along with um, how quick it took people to get wheelchairs for patients and some other uh, efficiency uh, measures. So enough about that. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about nutrition. Uh, right there. Okay. So today I decided to call my talk Up Your Game with Proper Nutrition. And I just wanted to show you um, this is Stony Brook. Let me this over here, I think. So um, this is Stony Brook. It's just one um, shot of the hospital. We're always under, re undergoing uh, remodeling and building and but this is one shot that we have and we have a lovely new addition to kind of blend in with our uh, old 1970s type towers. All right, so I'm gonna advance my slides this way. So what constitutes good nutrition? So we know that energies, um, nutrients provide energy for the body. Um, it maintains a constant internal environment and provides components for growth development and maintenance of body tissues also regulates a lot of different metabolic processes. So we have essential nutrients and they're necessary for body functions, but they're not synthesized or, or made by the body and most have to be, therefore be provided by the diet. So what are nutrients? So we talk to patients a lot of times about increasing calories, but I thought I would go a little bit deeper into some of the components so you understand why we're talking about a wide variety of foods are important 
and a good balance between carbohydrate, protein, and fat. So we also have water, fiber, phytochemicals that are contained in food, along with the essential and some non-essential nutrients, which I'll go, to, go into a little bit more in a future slide. We do uh, classify nutrients into six classes. So we have carbohydrates, protein, fat, vitamins, minerals, and water. So the ones I have starred actually are important because they actually contribute calories. So carbohydrates contribute four calories per gram, protein also four, fat nine calories per gram. We also know that the nutrients are important for the immune system and fighting infection. So if you are well nourished, you are better able to fight off infection, especially in the winter time um, with uh, some of the respiratory things that go around, a healthy immune system and adequate hydration is very important. So I'm just gonna start with carbohydrates. Um, their primary role is for energy to cells and the brain needs a good constant source of carbohydrates to function well. They provide a source of energy to facilitate body metabolism and control and regulate your body temperature. Carbohydrates provide glucose, which is in your blood, um, and spares the burning of protein for energy. You can use protein for calories, but that's not the goal. Carbohydrates combine with nitrogen to create other amino acids that are non-essential, and I have a slide that's gonna go into this a little bit. And then they're needed for structural components such as collagen, cartilage, bone, and nervous tissue. They also make foods taste good along with fats. So foods being palatable is something that's very important because you want your food to taste good. And it also helps with proper fat metabolism. And so you can develop ketones with too few carbohydrate intake, which is um, what the ketogenic diet does if people have read or heard that in, in the especially online. Okay, so these are just some of the common carbohydrate sources and where you can get your calories from. So things like cereals, grits, crackers and bread, pasta and rice, legumes are starch and a protein. And then you have things like potatoes, corn and plantains. Vegetables have a small amount of carbohydrate in them and fruit is mostly carbohydrate. Um, we usually do prefer some grain, uh, whole grain products and cereals because of their fiber content. And over half your diet is usually comprised of carbohydrate. So some people with impaired blood sugars or, or people we say have diabetes, they might go a little lower on that carb side. And people who have um, cardiovascular disease and we wanna give them a lot of high fiber to help lower their uh, cholesterol, we might go a little higher for them. The next really important ingredient in food or nutrient is protein. So protein mediates most of the actions of life. We definitely need this for growth and continued maintenance of health. It, the building blocks of protein are amino acids. So some are supplied only by the diet and others can be made in the body by the liver from other parts of um, food and supplied or supplied by the diet. So you have essential, um, essential function for muscles, tendons, nerves, bone, and teeth. Protein comprises collagen, a lot of enzymes which are involved in a lot of different uh, pathways in the body to, to help with just general metabolism and hormones. Proteins help maintain fluid balance, acid-base balance, which is very important and with respiratory syndromes especially, and can provide energy but more importantly is used for tissue building. So that's important why we need protein. So this is the slide I said was coming up. So essential in amino, so we have proteins and then the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. So then we have some that are essential, Well, now they are calling a newer term indispensable. Those the body needs to be supplied outside. And then you have non-essential non non or dispensable and that can be made in the liver. So essential amino acids cannot be made by the body. And so the diet um, needs to provide them. Um, and three that are common are valine, leucine, and isoleucine. Those are the building blocks we said of protein. So you'd still need non-essential um, amino acids for functioning, 
but they can be made, you know, taken like we said from the diet or in the liver from other building blocks of proteins or amino acids. So the liver kind of is a little assembly line and can put these other amino acids left over from other foods um, together so that they can make the non-essential. Okay. So how much protein does the body need and where do we get it from? So the body is continually breaking down and making protein. It's needed for growth and for normal protein turnover. So the greater your body mass, the more protein that is required. So the daily recommended intake for protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight for healthy adults. So I gave you an example because grams, kilograms doesn't really mean anything. Um, we don't, Americans especially don't always think in that way. In the medical community, we always convert your weight to um, kilograms and then protein is something that we do measure in grams. So the example here is a 165 pound man. So I divided their weight by 2.2 to get them into kilograms. And then I times that by the 0.8. And so this um, 75 kilogram reference man would require about 60 grams of protein a day. Now, you may require more than this during an acute illness or infections, or if you're a very active person. So how do we get this? We get this protein requirement by eating even an ounce of meat is seven grams of protein. An eight ounce glass of milk is about eight grams of protein. Three ounces of tofu is about eight. An egg is about six or seven grams of protein. Luckily, um, we usually eat our protein in about the size of a deck of cards, which is about three ounces. And that gives you at least one third of what you require for the day. Okay. okay, so just moving my bar up here so I can kind of see what's going on here. So this is um, just to give you another way of looking at how you could eat your foods. So the protein is here. Um, and usually the carbohydrates are a little bit more here uh, and dairy products. We would like people to have some dairy products for, you know, calcium and vitamin D. We do also like some fruit and a good amount of vegetables if possible. And this is how the typical American plate we would like to look. Sometimes with our patients, we do make some changes in this because, you know, the vegetables might be a little harder to chew or swallow. Um, instead of grains like um, rice, which is very sometimes difficult to um, chew and swallow, we might say mashed potatoes is a better choice or the pasta we might cut up a little finer just to make it easier to swallow. But I circled here, so um, vegetables have a small amount of protein in them. Fruits really don't. Grains also have a little, I always say protein that goes along for the ride, but it's not you know, a complete protein or um, you know, a full protein. So we get most of our full proteins that we need and require each day from things like eggs, beans, peanut butter. And then we have here fish, meat, um, chicken. And then we have some of the other goodies here like the ice creams, um, milk and dairy products also. But the largest amount we get is really by eating some meat or in some cases also, we said the, the beans and some tofu. Tofu by volume, though, you have to eat a fair amount to equal what we would get in three ounces of protein from a piece of um, chicken or fish. Now, fats. We like fats in our patients because it gives you a concentrated source of calories in a very small amount. Um, so they do provide calories to help meet overall calorie or energy needs. They're in a source, you need a certain amount of certain fatty acids for cell membranes, skin, eye, and brain health. So you absolutely need a certain amount of fat. Um, the fats make uh, transport in the blood possible with lipids. Um, again, I said satiety. So the fat gives you that feeling of fullness. It's the last thing emptied out of your stomach when you eat a meal. So a little bit of fat in a good diet really helps. It cushions your vital organs and prevent and provides joint lubrication. And without fat, you can't really absorb your fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K and the carotenoids. So the fat is really needed. We just like people to eat healthier sources if they can, um, especially if they have some, some um, 
pre-existing cardiovascular illness or high cholesterol levels that are being treated. Then we look at the type of fat that we give to patients, but we definitely include it in all the diets. So here I just have a little bit about the food sources of fat. So you have um, olive, canola, sunflower, and there's a whole variety out there. The ones we like the best really, as far as heart health goes would be olive oil and canola oil. Butter is also a source of fat that can add some calories. Um, avocado, avocado toast will give some calories, but avocado in the form of guacamole is also a lot of calories. So those are things that we do recommend to our patients. Um, fat and proteins sometimes come, come along together. And so you might have a nut butter, which would be peanut butter is a very common one, but almond butter, cashew butter, they're a fat and a protein. So in that small volume, you get um, you know, double bang for the buck, basically. Whole milk and dairy products I do use. I have a um, high calorie cookbook that I'm gonna show you a little bit later on. So again, if you know, we're not concerned about cardiovascular issues, we like the whole milk because again, for the same volume, you get a little bit more calories. And if we're trying to maintain weight for patients, this is something that we do wanna have happen. So we will go more with the whole fat milk and dairy products. Um, meat does contain fat, so does poultry, eggs, and some fish like salmon and bluefish and the other uh, high fatty fish, high fat fish contain fat. Nuts and seeds also contain fat and cheese I put separately, but it is in that dairy products category. So I do talk to my patients about water and hydration. Um, thirst isn't such a good indicator of hydration. The average person re, um, does require between six and eight, eight ounce glasses of water a day. But when you have to make frequent trips to the bathroom, which can become you know, a little more difficult, um, people tend to stop drinking as much water. So we also like adequate water um, to prevent kidney stones and urinary tract infections, which some people are prone to. Um, and we like to keep you well hydrated and keep patients away from the hospital as much as possible. We can thicken the liquids and this talk um, doesn't really go into all the thickeners, but I'm just giving you some ideas that if you know drinking water does cause you to cough a little bit, a lot of times in uh, clinic, I work with a speech language pathologist and we will thicken the liquids to see if that's better for a patient. Because water is so important, it is a lubricant, it is a component of saliva. It helps regulate your body temperature. In addition, for our patients, it helps thin secretions. So if you're using a cough assist device, you can um, help get the secretions out and it's easier if they're thinner. It aids in relieving constipation and it keeps your oral mucosa in your mouth, the tissues in your mouth and your skin moist. So it's very important as a nutrient. So I often talk to patients and this is what I try to say to them, especially since I think we're not in the habit of drinking a glass of water at a meal or a full glass of water with pills. But if you do take any pills, take a full eight ounces of water with them. That's more than once a day. We're already part on our way to meeting that eight glasses we need. You can also have a full glass of water at all meals in addition to the beverage you may consume. So even if you have a cup of coffee at breakfast, which kind of works against hydration a little bit because it's more of a diuretic. If you drink a glass of water, that kind of counteracts that. So it still counts as it going into the water, um, the water body, water pool. Um, juice also counts as a fluid. So you can drink juice, decaffeinated beverages, sodas and coffee can count. Um, foods liquid at room temperature, like fruit ice, jello, ice cream, other things like that also count. And I also say drink, drink, drink when you're close to the bathroom and it's easier. And you know, decrease your fluids at night or if you're going out where getting to the bathroom is not so easy. And again, as I said, we can thicken the beverages a little bit to make them easier. Um, and that's probably a whole talk for another day. Um, but we do work with patients to try to get them even, you know, putting a banana in a smoothie to make it slightly thicker sometimes helps some patients. If I can move these, I'm just trying to move my slides down. Oops. 
So what do I do in clinic when I see patients? What is my role as a nutritionist? So we weigh everyone when they come in. Um, and I usually on a first visit try to say, well, what did you, what was your usual adult weight? Because we're not just looking from, from one clinic visit to another, but that weight change will tell us a lot. But I'm also looking at how, when you started out on your journey, you know, what was your weight and what are you now? I look at the fluid intake. So I do ask people how much liquids they drink in the course of the day. It's um, one of their least favorite questions. Um, and I look at other past medical history and that I do behind the scenes. Um, I look through the chart to see, okay, am I asking this person about their blood sugar control? Um, you know, I will ask them any GI issues. If they're on um, um, uh, cholesterol lowering medication, then I'm not as worried about, you know, we have to use the skim milk products and so forth because the medication in this case is, is helping to take care of that and the diet. We want to, you know, then increase the calories. And I'm looking at weight trends, you know, what's going on and if we're losing weight, how much are we losing? And, um, you know, what can we do to stop that and keep the nutrition as high as possible? So I do estimate what you need in the course of a day. And so for estimating energy needs, if you haven't lost a lot of weight and you're at a, a good weight for, you, for what we establish your height to be, I usually do 25 to 27 calories per kilogram, and that's just to maintain your weight. 30 calories per kilogram if we want, if I want you to gain weight or if you have some kind of infection or a little stressed. And then 35 calories per kilogram is for, you know, um, highly stressed individuals who have increased calorie needs, um, maybe due to the work of respiration. So here I just gave you a few examples. So we have a 145 pound woman who's 66 kilograms. And if I times her by 25 calories, she ends up to be about 1,650 calories in a day as a requirement. And you don't have to worry about counting calories. I'm gonna give you a little breakdown later on to you know, help you assess where you are in the calorie world. I also gave you what a 185 pound man, if they were you know, with some mild stress, how many calories they would need. And 2,500 is a decent amount of calories in a day. I just want to circle back to um, increased calories for patients who um, are working hard to breathe. So in the hospital, um, we allow for more calories and in, in our outpatient setting here, we're allowing for more calories if you um, have difficulty breathing and we measure your FBC at clinic. So the respiratory therapist, and this is where part of the team is good because I usually ask the respiratory therapist what the breathing parameters look, look like. So I can say, okay, it's gonna be hard for them to gain weight or it's not gonna be hard for them to gain weight and um, you know, other things I may have to talk to the patients about. And it's based on um, the respiratory therapist and the testing that goes on. So if you are burning a lot of calories by the act of breathing, then you will not be able to maintain your weight. And this is something that we do talk to patients about at clinic. Okay, so tips for, um, for getting proper nutrition. So these are just some, some tips that I give to a lot of patients that need to maintain their weight and maybe have a smaller appetite. So eat, more, eat smaller, more frequent meals and snacks. So if you're a two meal a day person, which many patients I interview are, we may want them to increase, and, and now you have to be someone who we really want you to eat breakfast if, if you can, or late night, you're gonna have more of a substantial snack. And especially if you tire a little bit while you're eating, having a big meal isn't really the goal. Having a more frequent, smaller snacks might be a better way to keep your weight up. Um, we do like to keep the meals under 30 minutes, so very often I will ask how long it takes for someone to eat a meal. And we do this because we kind of feel like if it takes you over 30 minutes to consume a meal, you need to cut it up smaller or do something different because any calories you get in over that last 30 minutes is probably um, not significant and it's probably tiring you out and you might even be burning more calories than you're actually taking in just by trying to get those last few calories in. We wanna make every bite count. So you're gonna use some high calorie spreads on bread and vegetables. Again, using the whole milk that we talked about, sauces and gravies, olive oil, if you want to, something to make it moist and give it some more calories. 
Use easier to eat foods such as yogurt or eggs early in the day, especially if you're going to go out to dinner and socialize and talk a lot. And you know, this is energy conservation so that you can go out and have fun. If you're eating a bagel for breakfast, if that takes a lot of energy to chew and swallow. And so that may tire you out. Okay, so we do things like high calorie supplements um, that add calories, protein, and fluid in a small volume. And that, that might be easier to consume and help you meet your calorie goals and keep the meal times under 30 minutes. I work, as I said, with the speech language pathologist and we do you know, ask some similar questions and I've learned a lot um, by working with them for 20 years. So we do tell people to take smaller bites. We say it should be around the size of your thumbnail because we don't want you to take a big bite and have it block an airway. So keeping it smaller is better. Um, it also might keep your meal times under that 30 minutes and cause a lot less stress in chewing and swallowing. So if you cut the pieces a little small, smaller, you won't have to be chewing it for as long and tiring yourself out. Um, and usually the speech language pathologist who looks in the mouth and has have you um, imitate a lot of different um, kisses and um, puffing up your cheeks with air and how your tongue movement is. And that's how they determine what should be a good texture for you. So we do, as I said, talk about um, thickening the liquids for some patients. And we use some commercially prepared products already are thick. So you can get them pre-thickened and they may taste a little bit better. Um, water thickened is not usually popular with our patients, uh, but smoothies are. And a natural thickener like a banana will help thicken um, some things up and maybe enough to, so that you can actually swallow it. Simply Thick is the thickener that we kind of like the best because it's more of a gel, gel and it's less gritty. And so we think that it, it kind of um, doesn't hide the flavor of the food and you're not tasting, concentrating on the thickener. It, it seems a little bit more natural. Nectars aren't technically nectar thick, which I know we're getting away from that terminology with some of the new guidelines, but they are slightly thicker and that may be easier for some patients to swallow. And I have high calorie cookbook that I came up with with the interns and that can help um, add some variety to the diet as well as keeping the calories high. And there are, uh, there are other cookbooks on the market too. Um, so, Guidelines for oral in intake. How much do I really need in the course of the day to really meet my goals? So this, um, I think, ended up to be about um, 1,600 calories, roughly. So meat or protein, it's two or more servings. A serving is three ounces of a hamburger, fish, or two cups of beans. So you would need a hamburger and a piece of fish throughout the course of the day, and that would help you meet your protein needs. Milk also does that, milk or yogurt, um, two or more. And I do a lot with the Greek style yogurts because they have more protein in them. And um, even in our hospital, we use that as a supplement, the Greek yogurt, because there's about 12 to 14 grams of protein there, which is equal to two ounces of meat. So that is a good snack, especially if you like that and it's soft. Um, we, fruits and vegetables would be five or more. So that would be a half a cup of well-cooked vegetables, broccoli, string beans, carrots, um, one medium or half a, a cup of canned fruit, such as peaches or half banana or three quarters of a cup of berries. And those each count as a serving. Grains and starch. So Teresa always makes fun because she goes six to 11. She goes 11, 11 slices of bread in a day. But what it represents here is the amount of calories you would need. So you're not gonna eat 11 slices of bread in a day, I don't think. But a slice of bread counts as one serving. Half a cup of pasta is one serving or a third of a cup of rice is one serving. So you're not gonna, you know, you wouldn't just probably take a third of a cup of rice, you'd probably eat maybe a cup of rice. So that would be three servings there. So for the person who requires six, that would get you halfway. Although rice is not super popular with our patients because it's one of those foods that kind of spreads apart in your meal and can get dry and, and hard to swallow. Same thing with salads. Patients give up salads very fairly quickly because they spread apart in your mouth like a corn chip does and you have to work real hard to get all those little pieces out of your mouth. Um, so there are some of those piecemeal type foods that patients give up kind of quick 
um, because they're they're difficult um, and you need a certain amount of tongue dexterity to to actually um, chew and, and swallow them efficiently. And then fat fat goes from four to seven servings a day. Um, and so it would be a teaspoon of butter or olive oil, an eighth of an avocado, or a teaspoon, a tablespoon of cream cheese. These are just one, an example of one serving. So you would need, you know, um, double, triple that for, you know, several times a day to get to what you need. I also made it into a nice um, menu of things I think that would be easy for patients to have. So we did a scrambled egg, which would be a protein, in butter, which would be a fat, and then you could do a cup of oatmeal. Um, if it's if bread is problematic, and that would be too starch, and you could put butter, or you could put peanut butter because that will give you um, the fat you need. Water, or I have a high calorie oatmeal recipe in the cookbook that you could use. Um, lunch would be three quarters of a cup of tuna, so that would be three servings of protein. Um, lettuce and tomato would be the vegetable. A little bit of mayonnaise there. And if the roll of bread, because sometimes that becomes difficult to chew and swallow because um, we find toasting, it makes it easier for patients. But sometimes the roll is actually, um, it, it kind of um, becomes a, a round, um, I don't wanna say glob, but it, it's a little harder to get off the roof of your mouth and swallow. Um, eight ounces of whole milk, some applesauce, water, and you can add avocado or pick a high calorie smoothie or dessert to include with your lunch to get the calories you need, especially if the roll is not something that you're gonna, you're gonna be able to eat. So for dinner, we said three, three ounces of chicken and that's about the size of a deck of cards. And that's three ounces of protein. A cup of mashed potatoes with butter would be two starch and a fat. You could do a cup of carrots would be two vegetables and either butter or olive oil. And that would give you another, some more calories. I would say gravy or sauce is just extra calories, um, probably a fat serving or two, but we like those to make it easier to swallow and because they taste good. Vanilla yogurt and some berries and some water. And then also we like patients to have a cup of ice cream or a smoothie or water, some other high calorie snack at night uh, helps that. And so this is the one that's actually 17 to 2100 calories. The other one, let's see if I can go back. This is gonna vary, and that's why the serving sizes vary so much. Okay. So I uh, give our patients a lot of ideas with smoothies. You can use commercial products if that's easier for you. So there are things like Ensure Plus, Suspital. Uh, I think there's Boost products. There's a wide variety out there. There's Carnation Instant Breakfast that you can actually get at your own supermarket. Um, if you can tolerate milk, that's going to add calories to your day and protein. Uh, you can also use that as a base and put other fruit in there and blend it up. So for the smoothies, this is was is the guide and this is at the back of the cookbook that I give. Um, you can pick a base, you can pick any kind of milk you like, and about a cup of that. The thickener is you usually also add some protein, so that would be Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, some whey protein if you want to. Um, peanut butter or ice cream also will add some calories and some protein. You can add some fruit for flavor and sweetness. Uh, like we said, bananas really and mangoes um, help thicken a lot. Uh, if you're not someone who can eat a lot of vegetables, which is okay, you can sneak the greens in. Like spinach in a smoothie doesn't really have a strong flavor. It will look different. So you might put in a cup that's, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? not so clear, translucent. So you won't even see that it has that, that spinach in it and you really won't taste it so much. And then you blend. We have very high power blenders now that can really blend everything up. And just to get everyone started, I give them a peanut butter banana smoothie recipe, tropical orange creamsicle and vanilla banana orange smoothie. And we use a variety of milk here. We use ice cream. We use all different kinds of things to make it full of calories and full of protein. And then this is just a sample of what my high calorie, easy to chew uh, recipe cookbook looks like. Uh, I had a huge one and I finally shortened it because I, I felt like it was easier to give out to patients. And um, I think that I added the tips on how to add calories to meals and high calorie snacks. Um, so you can add an avocado, as we said. Uh, pudding is an easy snack usually to have at night, especially if you're tired. 
We said the Greek yogurt, some cottage cheese. Um, and then we gave you some ideas for snacks. You can do avocado toast, smoothies. Um, you can put some fruit with your Greek yogurt, apple with melted peanut butter, bananas with Nutella, ricotta cheese with uh, frozen blueberries. Those are all options for people. And then what I did with the rest of the cookbook is I put in, um, you know, other high calorie, you know, recipes. So that are easy to make. Sometimes the interns get excited, um, get very hard to prepare recipes and we try to tone it down so it's things that are a little easier for people to prepare. Um, you can still follow any previous dietary guidelines that you wish, such as low cholesterol or in some cases with uh, high blood sugars. We still have to watch how much carbs we give to a patient. Um, but um, the idea for us is higher calories in most cases is usually the goal. And so I just gave those same tips that I've talked about throughout the talk. So I am going to go into another section of what I do in, as my role as a nutritionist um, on the team is I do talk to patients and that's where I coordinate with the physician. I coordinate with the respiratory therapist um, to decide, you know, uh, if we're going to start to talk to people about a feeding tube and introduce the idea. So a fair amount of my patients do have feeding tubes. They either come with the tube already placed when they get to us or we're the ones that make the suggestion. So the standard guidance for feeding tubes is that, and these are, this is the gold standard for patients um, or patient population. If you have a certain amount of weight loss, either five to 10%, which is not a lot from your usual weight, or if you have significant swallowing issues, we will start bringing up the idea of the feeding tube. So this is how I coordinate with the respiratory therapist. I ask what the FBC is, because once it falls below 50%, and just to give you a little frame of reference, you know, 100 is good, in the 80s is still good. But once it kind of starts to fall down to the 50% or below, we want you to make your decision about the feeding tube because it's safest then. The procedure can be done uh, and it's an in and out procedure, meaning that you don't stay overnight and, and hopefully have no complications so that we can place the feeding tube. Um, if significant oral or fluid intake drops, we definitely discuss the, the feeding tube as an option. And we do understand this is a difficult decision for patients to think about, but it is something we bring up early um, so that it's something you can be thinking about what, what, whether you would want this, this way to ensure calories, um, protein, fluids, and medication administration. The tubes are placed um, in our facility, and I think most facilities, two ways. Um, the rig is a radiographically inserted G-tube, and that's done by our interventional radiology department. Um, and it's not just at Stony Brook, I think um, across the United States, interventional radiology departments are a little safer um, for the feeding tubes to be placed. It's, it's less sedation um, and the patients come in, they get it placed and they're out within a few hours. Um, PEGS, which is a percutaneously endoscopically placed G-tube is usually done by a GI doctor in a GI suite. And the tube lands in the same place, whichever one you get. And you can see by the picture I have here, just so you can see where the tube sits in the stomach and the part that leads to the outside um, that you would see on the outside. Um, they're both places outpatients and the goal is for you to come in, have the tube placed the next day. Um, and I'm gonna just tell you what we do. I assume most facilities are similar. A nurse uh, on the outpatient setting will come and teach you how to care for the tube and flush the tube and use the formula if that's what you choose to do. Um, and we had arranged to have a formula the next day. So you don't use the peg or the rig when you go home. It's about 24 hours after it's placed that we then show people how to use the feeding tube. So everyone always asks, what do we put down this tube? The other thing I just wanna mention is that um, Sometimes we put the feeding tube in and the person is still eating well. That's because their breathing parameters, the FBC has started to fall. So that tube just gets flushed with water once a day. You can continue to eat with your feeding tube. Um, this just ensures that we can give you adequate calories if you, you know, 
can't eat the amount of calories you need to maintain the weight. This is an insurance policy is what I usually say to the patients. So you can still continue to eat with your feeding tube because that's a very common question that I get. And also um, you can just flush it once a day and continue to eat by mouth until you, you, you need it. Um, formulas that we use are with our patient population are usually calorically dense or 1.5 calories per ml for our patients. Um, this means that you get more calories and less volume. So there are formulas that are one calorie per ml or unit that we're measuring, um, but that would require more feedings a day or greater volume at each feeding. And so that's why we usually pick the 1.5. There are even more nutrient dense formulas, but then we worry about dehydration. Um, so most of our patients do use the 1.5 ml uh, calories per ml formula. We generally use a low fiber formula with our patients because um, with this disease, the stomach empties a little slower and the fiber tends to aggravate that. But if patients come to me on a high fiber formula or they are you know, on the constipation side, we, we will sometimes mix formulas or we will um, use the high fiber formula. You always need additional water to meet hydration requirements. Um, so you're gonna flush, so that water counts, but in addition to that, we may give you a little bit more water down the tube. Most of my patients do the bolus feeding. So that means that they open up the, the cap on the feeding tube and they, um, there's a syringe that's about two ounces that uh, hooks into the feeding tube and they pour the container slowly into, into this um, syringe that goes in. And that happens about four to six times a day and is a you know, usual way to provide the feeding for most of our patients. Sometimes that doesn't, isn't as well tolerated as we like. So then what we try to do is put the formula into a gravity feeding bag. And this goes in a little slower, over about 30 minutes and has to be hung up, um, I guess above your heart. Um, and it flows in over a slower amount of time. Um, this does require a bag and a pole and the ability to hang this. And it takes a little bit longer, but it's better we feel than being connected to a pump. In the hospital, you will likely, um, most of the tube feeding patients are, are on a pump assisted feeding. And so um, this is, requires them to be you know, hooked up to this pump and it delivers the formula at a steady rate per hour, meaning you would get 50 mLs or roughly a little over an ounce, closer to two ounces every hour delivered to your stomach. Um, but then you're connected to something. So that's why we try very hard to change our patients over or start them right away on bolus feedings. Now, so with my patients, I do worry about, especially if they've had a lot of weight loss, um, I do worry about something called refeeding syndrome. And this is when we start to feed you after you've lost a lot of weight, maybe had a very low intake for a period of time. And so it's a consequence of going from fasting or starvation state or very limited calorie intake to now we're starting to feed to feed you. And so what happens is some of the electrolytes or things in your blood shift and then they become very low levels, which are not good. So that's why we look to see that these numbers are good, mostly the potassium, phosphorus and magnesium before we give you the tube feeding. And then we would, um, measure them perhaps again, after we've given you a couple of days of formula feeding to make sure that those numbers are still in good in, within range. So refeeding can be mild, moderate, or severe. Um, and that's why we try to measure these uh, parameters to make sure that we don't have any issues and we're, you know, cause you get the tube feeding to a place and you do go home. Um, the amount of calories, um, usually carbohydrate and fluid should really be gradually increased over several days to prevent this syndrome. So what we like to have happen is, you know, you get one container the first day um, and then we go up from there until we reach what we want, usually by one can, so that you slowly over like four or five days reach your calorie goals. Um, and as I said, we do look at really potassium, phosphorus and magnesium, and we correct this before we start the feeding and we just look to make sure that they stay stable while we're advancing the feeding. Okay, and 
let's see, I wanted to make sure I had time for questions. And so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I do share my calorie of the high, uh, high calorie cookbook with anyone who wants it. You just have to write to me and I will send you a copy. Um, it is wildly popular and I'm very happy that I um, came up with something that patients can actually use and value. Um, this is our team during COVID. Um, we had a uh, group happy hour. And so this was how we communicated during the pandemic a little bit. Uh, we were also, you know, on Zoom and on um, Teladoc and Teams. And sometimes we were not all in the same chat room at the same time, seeing the patient once in a while, those things would happen. And then now we would use the technology to actually laugh about it um, after that. Um, and then this is another picture of our team um, when someone retired. Uh, so we do like to have fun together as a team and do some things outside of work, which has always been good for us. So now I'm sure Teresa probably has some questions for me and I'm gonna stop talking. Unshare your slide. Unshare, okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, there, there was a question, what about antioxidants? What do you think about that for our patients? So uh, we love antioxidants. Um, we don't recommend a specific cocktail um, from supplements. We, we're on more of a whole foods approach. So I do believe that there's a certain interaction um, between antioxidants. So I would say that, you know, a multivitamin is good, especially if you're not taking in everything that you need. Um, but we like to see you get it from food. So like different colors are what we, we hope for like um, berries and um, dark leafy greens and things like that. Those are very important in the diet to give you some antioxidants. Um, if I get a feeding tube, can I take it out if I gain weight? So we probably wouldn't take it out in that case, but you could just flush it with water every day and we would try to leave it in place. Um, we, you know, that, that's generally what happens. Um, and I would, I, I'm excited if you gain some weight. So um, that wouldn't be something that we would be running to take out. Um, does the formula provide all of your daily nutrients? The formula does at a right volume. So if um, certain, certain formulas you need to give a thousand mLs or roughly a liter or um, a quart, I'm trying to make sure I give it units that everybody understands. Um, so if we give you a quart in a day, then yes, that usually you don't need um, extra vitamins and minerals outside of what's provided in the tube feeding. It gives you car carbs, protein and fat, and also the vitamins and minerals. And it goes up proportionally. So if you need 2000 calories, you need more vitamins and minerals than someone who perhaps needs 1500 calories. So you'll be getting more volume, you would be getting more vitamins and minerals. Okay, um, there are no other questions right now, but I'm going to uh, encourage people to go ahead and throw your questions in the Q&A box down at the bottom. And in the meantime, I'm going to ask Lorraine to discuss what if a family wants to make food to put down the tube? Um, I'm surprised you're asking me that question. I know, I can't stand it, but you go ahead and tell people because... Okay. So um, we do understand that people uh, want to eat real food and get some of the things that it provides. The formulas are, you know, synthetic and they're not, while they imitate food, they're not, and derived from foods, they're not the same as what you would eat. So as long as you can prepare, put the same food that the family is having, you flush the tube really well and you have an excellent blender and strain it, usually you can use, um, real whole foods for the tube feeding. The only caveat here is that sometimes if you don't, you can clog the tube. And also you have to put a certain amount of liquid in the foods to um, get them into the liquid enough state to get through the tube. And so then we might also be, you know, somewhat concerned about volume and the lower content. So I do have some recipes that I do give people. There are products on the market that um, are made from whole foods. They're even more expensive, but some things such as Liquid Hope and- um, And usually not covered by insurance. 
Um, yeah, we we're having a little bit better with the liquid hope, but um, the other one is complete lens, I think. And there are others on the market that do try to really just be more whole food type products. Um, yeah, could you talk about uh, how it gets covered by insurance? So this is another thing that people, so while I said it's an insurance policy and you flush it with water. So the tube is usually covered by your insurance to have the tube placement. For the formula to be covered by insurance, it should be the sole source of nutrition. And what that means is that you have you can have we, we put it in the chart as quality taste of life if you're just tasting foods and it's not most of your calories. You have to get most of your calories from your tube feeding product in order for insurance to cover it. So there's no supplemental tube feeding. Um, we either have to say that you're on the tube feeding and it supports you, or if you just want to do a supplemental one or two cans a day and eat, then, then you would probably be best off to buy those people that you sell. Um, and they also have to have a diagnosis of dysphagia. They have to have a diagnosis of dysphagia. Um, and, you know, we work with a speech language pathologist also um, for the formula, but usually by the time, you know, if we're writing for the formula, we need mo uh, moderate to severe dysphagia as a diagnosis for it to be covered as well. So I just want to throw a pitch out there. It's a beautiful thing for a patient to come to an ALS center because Lorraine has mentioned the respiratory factor. She's also mentioned the, the um, speech therapist and of course the dietitian. So we don't just work individually in a box and talk about the patient. We talk to each other and we all build um, the patient's needs on what we find for the patient. So without the speech therapist, I'm sorry, speech language pathologist diagnosing the patient with moderate to severe dysphagia, Lorraine, the dietitian, would not be able to get the feeding tube or the formula um, provided for by the patient. The tube itself could go in, um, but then the calories that you need to put down there would not be covered. We also wouldn't be putting a tube into a patient if we thought they were breathing okay, but if we have um, the testing done that we heard about earlier this morning, uh, the, the breathing tests that are done to evaluate the patient's breathing capabilities, we, that doctor this morning also spoke to us about feeding tubes being put in at a point in the patient's breathing capacity. So these are things we, we um, work hand in hand, and it's bigger than just the one person on the team. We all do work well together. So, um, you know, like that, that's how Lorraine can help justify and will also go in and say, oh, I just found out your breathing results were this. So I do want to talk to you about something else, right? Correct. And we also um, have a meeting afterwards, after we, everyone sees the patient and we come up with our care plan for them. So, you know, is the, you know, FBC low and does someone need to talk to the patient about a feeding tube, whether it's myself or the physician or the speech language pathologist. I also reinforce with patients using your, um, respiratory equipment so that you're, you can maintain your weight. So uh, we all try to reinforce what the message that the other person has throughout the, the team approach. And then I also call patients if, you know, we do find something in clinic after the fact, I do do a follow-up call if I need to, to make sure we've discussed everything they need. Yeah. So Lorraine, there are no other questions out there. If okay. you want to put, uh, well, Lorraine's uh, email address was on that final slide, and I also have a copy of that high calorie cookbook. Um, so if you can, if you want to email me, if the people out there know me, if you want to email the chapter or reach out to any of the clinical teams, they can all reach out to me. Everybody pretty much knows how to get in touch with me. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for joining us today and for giving this um, information out to our patients. And I hope everybody has a very nutritious weekend and hydrate yourself in the heat over the weekend. Thanks, Lorraine. Have a Thanks good afternoon. Me. My Bye. pleasure.